2 Kings chapter number 4. Now, for the sake of time, I'll kind of bring you up to speed. We'll begin in verse number 18. What has happened in this passage is Elisha has been going by a certain area where there's this woman and her husband, and they've kind of been putting him up and taking care of him as he travels through. And uh, the Lord gives her conception, and she has a child. She has not been able to have a child. And so things seem to be going along well for a while, but then when we come to our passage here in verse number 18, the child is going to die. So tragedy is about to strike this uh, woman here. 2 Kings chapter number 4, verse number 18. And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that it, he went out to his father to the reapers. And he said unto his father, My head, my head. And he said to a lad, Carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come again. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, It shall be well. Then she saddled an ass and said to her servant, Drive and go forward, slack not thy riding for me, except I bid thee. So she went and came unto the man of God to Mount Carmel, and it came to pass when the man of God saw her afar off, that he said to Gehazi's servant, Behold, yonder is that Shunammite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her, and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, It is well. And when she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to thrust her away. And the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her, and the Lord hath hid it from me, and hath not told me. Then she said, Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, Gird up thy loins, and take my staff in thine hand, and go thy way. If thou meet any man, salute him not, and if any salute thee, answer him not again, and lay my staff upon the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. And Gehazi passed on before them, and laid the staff upon the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Wherefore he went again to meet him, and told him, saying, The child is not awake. And when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. He went in therefore and shut the door upon them twain and prayed unto the Lord. And he went up and lay upon the child and put his mouth upon his mouth and his eyes upon his eyes and his hands upon his hands. And he stretched himself upon the child and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro and went up and stretched himself upon him. And the child sneezed seven times. And the child opened his eyes, and he called Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite. So he called her, and when she was come in unto him, he said, Take up thy son. Then she went in and fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground and took up her son and went out. I want to draw your attention back up to verse number 23. When this thing first starts, in verse number 23, he asked... What are you doing? You're going to go see this preacher, this man of God. Notice what she says. It shall be well. And then whenever the, the servant comes in verse 26 to meet her, he asks her the question, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? Look what she says in 26. It is well. That's kind of where I want to go this morning, dealing with all the chaos in our society and all the trouble and everything that's going on about the peace that God gives us in times of trouble. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for the reading of the Word of God. And I pray that this book may have an effect on our life. We thank you that your Word changes lives. And God, I pray that all of us would come under the hearing of the Word of God this morning, that it might help us, it might encourage us to direct our attention, our thoughts, our hearts toward Jesus Christ. We thank you for our Savior. We ask these things in His name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our country literally is being ripped apart. Everybody knows I'm not here to give you news. But it's literally being ripped apart. But as Christians, we have a different fellowship. In other words, 
We are not supposed to be of this world. In other words, we are to be separated enough to where although we have to rub shoulders, we have to deal with things in society, we don't have to be shaken and disturbed and distraught by everything that's going on. I believe as Christians, we're able to say, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what the situation, we're able to say, it is well with my soul. And I think that peace that God gives is what the world is searching after. And they think, well, if we can just get everything contained, if we can all be healthy, well, you know, there's a problem. Even if you're healthy today, you might not be healthy tomorrow. Even if you live 60, 70, let's say you live to be 102, you are going to die, and then what? You see, what's got everybody all out of whack whenever you have some type of virus and you have some type of threat to humanity is the gloom reality of there's a 100% death rate. And people who die without Jesus Christ have to face eternity without the forgiveness of sins. And without the forgiveness of sins, nobody can go to heaven. There is only a place reserved for them, as the Bible describes, as hell. And people don't want to face that. It's like... Let's just try to deal with what we have to deal with. We want to keep everybody healthy. Obviously, we want to avoid any type of tragedy. I'm like the next guy. I like to be comfortable. I want my air conditioning. I want my belly full. I want a good night's sleep. I don't want to get sick. But the fact of the matter is, things go bad. Somebody could be breaking in your house to steal your food. I mean, that's just the reality. The fact of the matter is, there is evil in the human heart, and that evil that we see in our society that's kind of breaking out, it's always been there. When somebody kills somebody, you don't now say, I know we do in our culture, we say so-and-so is a murderer. Why? Because they killed somebody. You're not looking at it right. They killed somebody because they already were a murderer. The evil is inside of the human heart, and that evil is inside of every single one of us. Giving certain circumstances and certain things in your own life, there's no telling what you would do. So before we point the fingers and before we want to be all mad, and before we want to look at somebody and say, look what they did, they quit serving God, and they did such and such, we need to consider that if it were not but for the grace of God in our lives, where would we be? Now, is it well with you? Amazing to me this lady could say this in the situation that's going on. And, of course, we know and I believe that because of the knowledge, because of the information, I mean, who doesn't have access to the Encyclopedia uh, Britannica 24 hours a day now? I mean, you just ask Siri, you ask Alexa, whatever the other woman's names are. They're always women's names for some reason. How come they don't say ask Jim or ask Bob, you know? <laughs> whatever happened to that? I say, ask Jim. Jim says, what do you want? <laughs> but the thing is, you know, everybody's got all this knowledge, all this information. And the Bible told us some things about this back in the book of Genesis. When everybody began to get together, God said, now there's nothing that they will not imagine that they will do. So what did he do when they began to get together in Genesis chapter 11? And all the cultures and all the societies got together. They got together so they could become their own God. They got together so they could push God out. And God said, I'm going to bust them up. I'm going to separate them and isolate them. You know, isolation is a good thing. Quarantine can be a good thing, right? Of course, you might not build up a good immune system. <laughs> However, everybody comes together and they begin to fight. It's kind of like the uh, National Geographic article where they had this fossil of these saber-toothed tigers that had locked in. And one tiger had bitten the other so much so that his tooth actually went into the bone and would not release. So there they both died eventually. And that's what you see in a society just locked. Well, I have my opinion. Well, is your opinion God's opinion? That's the question. You know... Uh, it's just a wicked society. And people don't want to say that. They don't want to admit that. We are living in a wicked world. The Bible says, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. You say, what about America? Is America going to fall? I want to submit to you, America has already fallen. It's fallen a long time ago as far as morality goes. It's fallen a long time ago as far as giving God, as a corporate nation, giving God any type of, and I'm talking about the God of the Bible. 
You know, not this God, whatever you want to make him or she to be. I'm talking about the true God. This nation does not give God glory at all. You say, well, what about old glory? What about the flag? What about the red, white, and blue? Old glory is not giving God the glory. And so this country's in a bad way. And so as we look at all the stuff that's going on, the common uh, thing for us to do oftentimes is to be wrapped up in it and to sometimes let our own lives be ripped apart by allowing all these things to affect us. And we get all tangled up and all tied up. Here's my advice and I'll stop on this. Not stop the message, but I'll stop with this thought. Just listen to as little news as possible. Whatever, a little bit you got to get, find out if it's going to rain. Is it raining? Just look outside. Yep, five inches. It's raining. <laughs> Just listen to as little as possible and go on and try to live your Christian life and do what God wants you to do. And you know what? The Lord wants to fellowship with you. And God loves us so much, He still wants to minister to us through the Bible. He'll show up when you kneel to pray. He'll show up when you read the Bible. When you try to help somebody and be a blessing to somebody and an encouragement to somebody. God's still doing plenty of things. So don't be all tangled up and tied up fighting the devil all week. Kind of like the lady, she stood up in testimony and said, I just want to testify that I've been having a rough week. I was fighting the devil all week. And her husband's sitting beside her. He says, well, you know, she is kind of tough to live with. <laughs> he just figured, you know, she was calling him the devil. But uh, let's look at this lady's life. In verses 8 to 17, we won't read all of it, but notice in the text here, when Elisha meets her, she immediately wants to try to do for him. It's kind of like we had Ms. Sue's memorial service yesterday, and we had a lot of great testimonies, people talking about how she was just so um, caring about other people. And even though she was born with physical maladies and physical problems, but she was always trying to do for others. This lady here, the Bible says she was a great woman. Now, what does it mean by that? It's used about a thousand times in the Bible. Um, it's used for Abraham, David, Moses, Mordecai, John the Baptist. I think it's referring in the moral sense. It's not referring she's great like uh, she's big or large or something like that. Um, I think the idea here is that she is a good person. And you notice Elijah's going by. She gets with her husband and says, look, let's make him a little room. Let's make a place where he can stay when he passes through. He's preaching here. He's a prophet. He's traveling from place to place. The idea of a, what, a, what they call a prophet's chamber back in the day. That's where this idea comes from. And so they do that. And then Elisha says in verse 13, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for, for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? Wouldest thou be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host? You see, Elisha knew the king personally. Elisha had connections. He possibly could do some things, pull some strings, and maybe get her some things that she might need. And what does she say? Look at the next verse. Verse number, the last part of verse 13. She answered, I dwell among mine own people. In other words, I don't need anything. Here's what, the first thing I want to say about this lady. She's satisfied. She can say it is well, but she could also look back and say it was well. This is before she ever has a child. She says, you know what, I'm, I'm satisfied. Man, if we could just find some people that were content. Paul says in the book of uh, Timothy, having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Can you just be satisfied? I was making a comment as we were talking earlier about uh, it's raining, you know, and then we're going to get to griping about the rain. Man, it's Noah's flood out there. I just can't believe all this rain. My grass is growing and grass doesn't grow. I can watch it grow. It's like... And then we're going to gripe when we start getting into a drought. Give it about three weeks and we'll go three weeks without rain. We're going to be like, man, Lord, send us some rain. It's so hot, the humidity is killing me. You were the same person talking about how cold it was two months ago. <laughs> Waking up trying to get covers and getting coffee and all cold. And This lady here was satisfied. She was a content person. She was a, a caring person. And she was blessed. And she looked at her life and said, you know what? I've been blessed. Now here we are as Christians, and not only as Christians, but as American Christians. Now just look at just the fact of us being in this country. Obviously we have blessings. 
When we talk about the poverty problem in America, one of the biggest problems with people that are poor is they have an obesity problem. So they're not starving to death, right? Amen. We are in a blessed country. We are in a prosperous country. And really, I'm just being honest. If I went the next several months and everything fell out and the bottom fell out and we don't have the pleasures and the prosperity and the money and the food and all those things, you know what? I have had a blessed life. I can look back and say it was well. God was good to me. I was in a country, when you think about the entire world, you talk about blessed, we don't even understand that. We come in here, we sit on our padded pews, we soak in our nice air conditioning, we get in our nice cars, we go to our nice homes, we eat our nice meals, we have our nice medical facilities and attention, whatever we need. We don't even realize, comparatively speaking with the rest of the world, how blessed we are just physically. And then think about your Christian life. If you are saved, you know what that means? That means you're not going to hell. That means your sins have been absolved. They've been forgiven by the blood of Christ. That means He has forgiven you your trespasses. He's adopted you into His family. Your name's in the Lamb's book of life. He's got a place reserved for you. That's what He said. I go to prepare a place for you. John 14. Not only are you not going to hell to pay for your sins because Jesus did, now you're going to heaven when you die. The worst thing that can happen for you is that you die, but then you go to heaven. I mean, you think about blessed. And not only that, the Lord gave us His Word, His Bible. King James Bible, that is. He gave you this book right here without error. You can read it. You can trust it. You don't have to question it. You don't have to doubt it. You don't have to know Hebrew. You don't have to know Greek. You don't have to read commentaries. Go find out what Dr. Doolittle said about it. You can come to the Bible, and you've got the Holy Spirit on the inside. If you're saved, God will help you to understand. You say, well, I don't understand all the Bible. No, nobody does. One old preacher said, if you understood everything in the Bible, you would know just somebody just as dumb as you wrote it. All right? This is God's book, so some things obviously we can't understand. God's mind is, is greater than our mind. His thoughts are not like our thoughts. But you know what? We can make a lot of sense when we look around through the lens of the Bible. If I look at the world just through my eyes, I can be all distressed. But when I look through the lens of the Scripture, it makes perfect sense. The Bible outlines how the end times will be. The Bible tells us how the world will come together and unify. The Bible tells us how all these things will happen as far as technology. There's all these things. There are little clues here and there. I believe we're seeing some of this. Obviously, that's pretty clear. The Bible speaks in the last days men will depart from the faith. We've seen that as far as Christians go giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. He says over in Timothy, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of their own selves, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Boy, don't we see that. And they're playing reruns of 1980 basketball games. Man, how much basketball do you have to have? Amen. It's like, good night. People are flipping out because they can't have their sports. They can't have their pleasures. I was excited at least for a little while they shut the bars down. Amen. Yeah. Alcohol-related deaths have been way worse than any type of virus that's been around. Nobody wants to look at the numbers on that. So why do you preach against alcohol so bad? Because it kills people. That's why. Go look at the numbers. Kills them dead. A whole lot worse than smoking cigarettes. I don't think you need to suck on a cancer stick either. However, amen, however, when you look at alcohol and the destruction that it causes... That's why the Bible has so much to say about that kind of stuff. So, lovers are pleasures more than lovers of God. We surely see that in our society. He talks about kids being disobedient to parents. He talks about the sodomy issue, which we've seen in our society, especially in recent years. The Bible says, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So, as a Bible-believing Christian, we can look through that lens of the Bible, and we can say, you know what? It's well. It's okay. We can see from Scripture and we can understand how we're supposed to react. Unfortunately, a lot of Christians are just reactionary. You know what the church typically does? And when you study 
American history and church history, and you kind of put them side by side, you see the very same thing. You will see how the church responded and how the church obviously responded during the, um, the revolutionary days. You see some things there. Obviously, you see the church issue dealing with slavery. You see how the church responded during the prohibition days, during the abortion days, during the whole sodomy issue that I mentioned. The church always, there's always a response to that. And that's oftentimes how people are. Instead, what we need to do, we need to always look through the lens of the Bible. So when we see it, we see it real clear for what it is. People are acting out, they're doing things that is in their nature to do. It's the natural course of things. It is well. How are things going in the world? People say, how is the world treating you? Well, the world ain't treating me too good, but the Lord's treating me good. Amen. 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 So she was satisfied. She said it was well. She could look back in the past and say, you know what? I have everything I need. Elisha, you don't have to pull any strings. You don't have to get, you know, anything. I'm good. I just want to be a blessing to somebody. And then Gehazi tells Elisha, you know, she doesn't have any children. So Elisha goes and tells her, God's going to give you a child. And she has that child. And of course, we know tragedy comes. The child gets old and he has some type of heat stroke. That's back in the days where kids used to work. Amen. Uh-oh, you said, I'm going to get on to young people. Yeah, amen. I always say, you kids, you need to learn how to dig a hole. And if you don't know how to do much work except like this, you know, with your thumbs, playing video games or texting or whatever, or you need to learn how to grab a, a shovel and dig a hole. You say, well, I hadn't dug a hole in a while. Just come see me. I'll find one for you to dig. Amen. <laughs> And you get these little things, you know, it's kind of like the kid that ran into his, his dad made him finally go outside and work, do some work. And he didn't know what a chore was, but he ran out and his dad made him go work. He comes running into his mama crying and screaming, like, what is all this stuff? You know, he was sweating. He was like, what is all this? <laughs> it's sweat! <laughs> Be like, what's the stuff? Yeah, yeah, you ever pulled on a lawnmower rope until you had, you know, your, your arms about to die, the thing won't crank? Everybody needs that great experience. Amen. And you can't start the piece of junk. Then you break your toe because you kick it too hard. Amen. All right. Notice verse number 26 as we lead into the story. The boy goes out. He has some type of heat stroke. He dies. Verse number 20. She sends, tells her husband, look, give me the best team of horses. I'm, I'm taking off after the, the preacher. She's satisfied, but obviously she is saddened. I mean, bad things happen, folks. You know, the oldest book in your Bible is not Genesis. Genesis obviously goes back further. It goes back to the beginning, the word Genesis from the word gene. The oldest book in your Bible, as far as when it was written, is the book of Job. Job is the oldest book, and you know it's the oldest book because he never deals with the Old Testament law. The Old Testament law, of course, Moses is, gets that in Exodus chapter 20. So Job's the oldest book in the Bible, and the oldest book in the world. And Job deals with the most fundamental problem that we all have, and that is why do bad things happen to good people? Job was a good man. The Bible says he was an upright man, one that feared God and eschewed evil. And all this bad stuff starts happening to Job. And all this stuff starts happening. Job is in a predicament here. His wife gets to the point to where she says, I mean, all their kids die. They lost all their money. They lost all their possessions. And then Job gets sick. And she says, look, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? And he says, you speak as a foolish woman. You know, you have a good person and bad things happen. Here's a good lady. As a matter of fact, she was helping God's man, the prophet there. And here's this son that God had given her. And then this tragedy happens. You know, if you're a Christian, that's no guarantee that bad things are going to happen. And you know, I think a lot of times what happens as far as believers is we don't get deep enough in our theology. And I want to encourage you to study your Bible and to study some things about God and to know God, not just from knowing Him personally by way of your experience, although you do have your own experience, I get that. You need to know what the Bible teaches about God. The Bible teaches in 1 John that God is love. 
That means he's omnibenevolent. That's a fancy word, like the word benevolent. He's all loving. The Bible teaches that all God's judgments are right. In other words, when God decides to do something or allow something to happen, God can't be wrong in doing that. God is not a bad God. God is not a mean God. God does not do anything wrong. So you need to have these things in order. You need to know some things about God, what the Bible teaches about God. So when things happen in your life, you can calibrate your mind to think right. You know, there's a thing called propaganda. You've heard of that. You know, back in the days of communism and so forth, you had this uh, people that would try to sway people, and it's taking place now. It, main, it mainly takes place now on college university campuses. You have uh, tenured professors, and typically tenured professors are very anti-God and anti-conservative idea, and what they do is they feed this stuff into people's minds. And as they feed things into people's minds, they get this idea. And as they begin to hear things, they process material and they begin to formulate their opinions that way. So what happens if you're not careful? This is what will happen. What will happen is you'll begin to believe things that you hear. If you listen to it long enough, you say, well, I'm strong, I can hear it. You know, I'm going to sit here and listen to the, you know... Okay, just listen to it long enough. 24 hours a day, if somebody said, God is mean, God is harming you, God did, this, did not do you right, God didn't treat you right, you deserve better, look at so-and-so, you know, if you heard that 24 hours a day, eventually you're going to at least maybe say, I wonder if that is right. You hear this propaganda over and over and over. Men and women are equal. 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 Men and women are not equal. You just can't believe I said that. Get some of you big guys up here and let's have an arm wrestling contest and see if any women can beat the men in arm wrestling. And then let's get the women up here that have had kids and see if any men can beat women in having children. Men and women are not equal. They're not made the same. God did not make you the same. And therefore... But see, you get this stuff in your head. All men are created equal. All men are created equal. All men. That's not in the Bible. It's not biblical. Some people are smarter than others. You ever knew somebody that was smarter than you? Of course not. Some people are more talented than others. Some people are stronger than others. You see what I mean? This thing, this idea. And if you're not careful, you begin to listen to this stuff. Bad things happen to good people. Just because she's doing right doesn't mean something bad's not going to come into her life. She's saddened by this. She's troubled by this. But she's able to say in verse number 26, It is well. She did say to her husband, It shall be well. And we're always thinking about the future because as a believer, we're just kind of in a temporary state right here. People say, You believe in purgatory. Absolutely not because the Bible doesn't teach it. If you want to talk about purgatory, this is your purgatory right here. I mean, we're headed to a better place. If you die, you're either going to heaven or hell. You're not going to some intermediate state. The Bible doesn't teach that at all. We're down here 60, 70, 80 years, 90 years. We got some four score years and above in here this morning. Praise the Lord for that. But you start hitting 100, 102, 103, you're getting closer to the end. <laughs> and then what? I said that earlier. So we're in a temporary state, so it shall be well. Things are bad down here, it doesn't have to define me. Things are sad down here and things are rough down here. We are living in a cursed world. We're living in a place the Bible describes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that Satan is the God of this world. So you have to keep that in perspective. There's a thing out, a virus out called the sin virus, and it's infected everybody, and people do things that are wrong, and they do things that are bad because of that. And so do you. So do I. Bad things happen. And the Lord allows bad things to happen. The story is not finished being written yet. And the Lord understands these things. Think about Jesus Christ. When He died on the cross, He experienced suffering. God the Father turned from Him and laid all the sin of the world and punished His Son, Jesus Christ. Remember what Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane? He said, Father, if there's any way to take this cup from me, 
Then he said, Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And God punished Jesus Christ and allowed that suffering to take place on Jesus Christ. So God understands the fact of trouble, but notice her faith in trouble. She could say it as well. It's been a blessing for me as a pastor to be around some of, some of you and to watch you go through things. A little piece of me, I think, goes every time we lose a church member and someone passes on and goes to heaven. It just, there's a piece that hurts, you know, because you love that person, you pray for that person, and you see them grow, and you see them mature in the faith, and, and different things, and, and then they, they, they're gone. Their seat's empty now. They're not here. And they've gone on. And maybe you're not as close to them as, as the pastor. Sometimes I get kind of close to everybody in a sense. And so it's a little piece of you that seems to go each time. But one blessing that I've seen as I've watched the saints go on is on many occasions being there, you know, either days or hours before they pass and be able to hear some testimony come from them where they say, you know, I'm ready to go be with the Lord. I've had them tell me that, you know, I know I'm saved. I know I'm ready to go to heaven. And to see that peace on that saint of God, or to maybe watch loved ones, some of you in here, and watch you as you've seen your loved one and be able to say, you know, it's okay. It is well. It is well. Because when you love somebody and you know they're going to heaven, you don't want them laying there in pain or you don't want them laying there not able to get up again. And you want what's best for them. And what's best for them is to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. And to be able to see that from some of you is an encouragement to me. She was able to say it as well. She had faith. Notice finally... She was not only satisfied, and she was saddened, but she was secure. Verse number 23, she told her husband when she'd get ready to leave, she said, it shall be well. Prophetic faith. She knew God had a plan. God had given her a son for a reason. I'd like to kind of defer back to Abraham's story. You know the story how God gave Abraham a son in his old age, Abraham and Sarah. And he said, I'm going to give you a son, and from that son, from Sarah... I'm going to give him a son, and him a son, and him a son. It's going to be like the stars of the heaven from multitude, a whole nation of people. You believe that, Abraham? Abraham said, yeah, I believe it. Well, God finally did give him a son. His name was Isaac. And in Genesis chapter 22, God said, I want you to take your son, thine only son, whom thou lovest. Take him up on top of one of these mountains, and I want you to offer him for a sacrifice. The Bible doesn't say anywhere in the Old Testament or the New Testament that Abraham hesitated or doubted or questioned God. Why? Well, the Bible gives us a little bit of indication as to why Abraham had such great faith in the book of Hebrews. The Bible says that he accounted that God was able to raise him from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. He's thinking, you know what? Sarah was 90 years old. I was 99 years old. We couldn't have kids. It was past that time. God gave us a child from a dead womb. So if God wants me to kill this child, that means, and he's already told me he's going to give him a son and him a son and make a great nation, that means God's going to raise him back up from the dead. That's the only explanation. So God, you said it, I'll do it. That's faith. And I believe she had a very similar faith. God had given her that child. And she was looking, not at the problem, she was looking at the prophet, Elisha. And she went to that prophet. And she's like, I told you don't deceive me. Why, are you, why, why did this happen? She was secure in her faith. This is where I want, you, I want to go with this and we'll be done. She had peaceful faith, not just prophetic faith. Look, I don't know what the, what the next few months and years may hold. I don't know how much, you know, and I, and I said this in our earlier service, and I'll say it to some of you, and you can like it or not like it. Some of you are more passionate and concerned about your liberties than you are your Christian faith. And I'm an American too. I don't want to give up my liberties. But God doesn't cease to be God just because people aren't free anymore. The majority of Christians, when you look at church history the past 2,000 years have had to live under duress and have had to worship maybe not even in freedom. I'm not a gloom and doom preacher. I'm not trying to paint a bad picture and make you go out and just look for the you know devil under every uh, tree and under every rock and that kind of a thing. 
and try to find every conspiracy, you can definitely get freaked out on all that stuff. But I'm telling you, it's going to be all right. So whether they're going to track us down, they're going to make us take a, 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 a vaccination, and they're going to track us, they're already tracking you down. What are you talking about? You're already giving them all your information because you want a smartphone. <laughs> You're already telling them everything you do every time you put a punch a little key on that keyboard. You've already turned over your life to them. <laughs> Don't tell me they're not tracking you. Who are they? Big brother is watching you. Well, big sister's in your closet, so who cares? What I'm telling you as Bible-believing Christians, it's going to be all right. I know what the Bible lays out, prophetic faith, and that leads to peaceful faith. Yeah, this world is headed to hell. This world is headed, is the Bible's right, according to the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation, to a ruler that's going to rise up by way of peace. And he's going to bring these kings underneath his authority. There will be a ten kingdom type of situation to where they will give their power and control to this man. There's going to be a little bit of opposition from the people of the east. Go figure. Amen modern day. There's, be, there's going to be some opposition from the people of the East and there will be a battle that will take place. But in the end, what will take place will be the whole world worshiping this man and following him as the son of perdition, the son of the devil himself. That's where this world is headed. Now prior to the Antichrist and the mark of the beast and all these things you've heard about is the rapture of the church. When Jesus Christ returns to take us home to heaven. And it's prophesied, of course, in John 14. He said, if I go to prepare a place, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Paul said, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior. Paul said, the dead in Christ will rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord's. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. In other words, it shall be well. So preacher, they took all my assets. They froze my bank account. If they wanted your money, they could just hit a couple of strokes, whoever they are, whoever they is, and they can take all your money. They could turn your car off as you're going down the road, I guess. I don't know. Man, don't you like those old cars? I used to have an old truck, and you know, if you wanted to, you could take the battery out after you crank it up. Now, your battery only lasts about two years, and if your battery shuts off, the whole car shuts off. And nobody can work on anything anymore now anyway. You've got to have a computer. So you get all stressed out. You get all worried about the scenarios that can be painted. Here's the, the fact of the matter. The fact of the matter, as dark as it is outside, it's going to get darker. But the paradox of that is the darker it gets there, the brighter we can shine for Jesus Christ. Because we can still say, you know what? It's well. I'm not saying I don't care about people. I'm not saying that, but look, I'm not of this world anyway. I'm a Christian first. I'm an American second. So would you fight for your country? Would you fight for your community? Yes, I agree with all that. I'm not saying anything against that, but this is what I'm saying. I'm saying, first and foremost, I know the rest of the story. The Lord's got all this under control, and we know where we're going, and that gives us clarity, and it gives us purpose for the present. One great thing about Bible prophecy is that it helps you in the here and now. Because as I see the dark clouds on the horizon, I realize, you know what? Yeah, the days may get dark. This is just a small taste of what you read about in the book of Revelation. According, according to current stats with population stat, uh, uh, numbers and so forth, when you read the first part of the Great Tribulation period there in Revelation 4, 5, and 6, you're looking at, you know, something like, I don't know, 80 to 100 million people. No, no, it's, it's 2 billion. Something like 2 billion people like that. You're looking at World War II with all of its casualties. You're looking at about 56 million dead. We're talking about something way worse than that. And so... We see all these things on the horizon. We realize this is where the world's headed. But as a believer in Jesus Christ, I have clarity because I know that He's not appointed us to wrath. I know I'm not going to hell. I know that He's going to return. I can have peace. I know the truth. I know how to have forgiveness. I can tell somebody, look, you're all upset. You're all tied into what's going on. You're worried about the stability, the security of your life. 
Here's where your security needs to be anchored in. It doesn't need to be anchored in Wall Street. It doesn't need to be anchored in your health and in your wealth and in all these things that we're so used to. It needs to be anchored in Jesus Christ and eternity. That's where it needs to be anchored. And then come what may, let the winds blow. You'll be able to sit back and say, It is well with my soul. Now if you know the hymn, we oftentimes sing it. It is well with my soul. Maybe you don't know the story behind the hymn. Horatio Spafford, he was a lawyer. He was involved in real estate and he tried to help out the city of Chicago back in, I think it was 1871. They had the huge Chicago fire. He lost about everything he had done. And he was a Christian man. He was associated with D.L. Moody and, and Ira Sankey and their evangelistic efforts and so forth. And he was a very, uh, very good man as far as helping out community. But he lost nearly everything in that fire in 1871. And then, like two years prior to that, I think, he had lost a son. His son had died. So all this stuff had happened with that Chicago fire. I'm sure you've heard about that in history. And uh, he needed a break. And Moody and Sankey were having uh, revivals overseas in Europe. So he wanted to go on a trip and maybe assist them with their mission work and revival campaigns. So he went ahead and sent his wife because he got held back on business. He sent his wife and daughters with them, uh, with her. And then he got the news that the ship that they were on had been struck by another vessel. And the word came back from his wife. The four daughters were gone, obviously. She just said, saved alone. It was just her. She's the only one alive. He's already lost everything, already lost his son. He's trying to take a break, trying to help out the preacher. All this tragedy happens. So as quick as he can, he goes overseas to go to, go to London to be with his wife. And he gets with the captain and talks to the captain. And the captain tells him when they're getting close to the spot where the ship went down and where his daughters died. And that's when he penned the words that we're so familiar with. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Right at the spot where his daughters had went down. And he went on to write that hymn which we sing and get such a blessing out of today. And we're able to say in the face of tragedy, in the face of chaos, in the face of confusion, as a believer in Jesus Christ, we're able to say, it's well with my soul. Christian, I don't care what happens in your life. You're anchored in Him. And you're secure in Jesus Christ. Don't let the devil pull you sideways. Turn you around. And confuse you. To where you are anchored in the things of this life. It's so easy to be sidetracked. Especially in the times in which we live. Can you say it as well? If you've never trusted Jesus as your personal Savior, it is not well with you. You might think it is. You might have some temporary relief. But eternity is not going to be a good end for you. The best thing you can do is make it well. You say, how do I do that? Do I join a church? Do I get baptized? No, it's not about all that. It's about putting your faith in what Jesus Christ has already done. He died on the cross for your sins. He was buried. He rose again from the dead. He made the atonement, the sacrifice for your sins. All you have to do is have faith and put your faith in Christ. The Bible says, As many as received unto them gave you power to become the sons of God. If you take Him, He'll take you. It's that simple. The Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It can be well with your soul if you'll put your faith in Jesus. Just like that. Peace like a river. And you'll be able to say, it's well. It might look bad on the outside. Tragedy comes. But you'll be able to say, it is well with my soul. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our pianist is going to come and play just a brief invitational hymn. Maybe you're going...